Well, good afternoon. I'm Tatiana Kerchik. I uh, manage the Atomic and Molecular Physics Program at AFOSR. I've been at AFOSR for uh, four years now. And uh, the program roughly um, divides into two broad thrusts, uh, cold quantum gases and quantum information science. And you can see here a partial list of uh, sub-areas in those two thrusts. And in blue here are highlighted the areas that um, I will talk about throughout the talk today uh, that the results from this past year that I selected to talk about fall, fall into. Um, but before I move to that, uh, let me um, briefly talk about scientific opportunities in this field and uh, corresponding transformational op opportunities. And the arrows here um, designate uh, the current or in the past year really trend in these, uh, these, uh, these areas. So dipolar matter and ultra-cold molecules is a very, um, currently very active and new area of interest uh, in atomic and molecular physics uh, uh, that uh, sort of was spawned by uh, uh, the ability to have realized uh, systems with dipole-dipole uh, interaction. I'll talk more about that uh, in, in an example later. And uh, ultra-cold molecules fall kind of uh, in there because polar molecules do have a dipole moment. And we are very active in the ultra-cold molecules um, area. There's a MURI uh, that's been going on for a couple of years. And the payoff um, really for studying these things is that, um, as I hope to convince you perhaps a little later, that they really offer new opportunities for discovery of uh, truly novel exotic phases of matter. And also with molecules, uh, one can study chemistry in the quantum regime. And there's actually a brand new ARO MURI that hasn't started yet on that topic as well. Quantum memories and interfaces is a research area that's been going on for a while, but recently there have been some breakthroughs that uh, caught my interest, and I started a MURI this past year in this area. And the, uh, the obvious uh, um, uh, payoff there is uh, a, a quantum repeater someday that will enable long-distance secure quantum communication. Quantum simulation is another area where AFOSR uh, has a strong role uh, together with DARPA. Um, and I'll talk a lot about that throughout the talk because I'm highlighting some results from MURI that's ending this year. Uh, but it's really about uh, using uh, cold atoms in the so-called optical lattices to simulate uh, the so-called strongly correlated condensed matter systems whose properties we cannot reliably calculate with conventional computational means because those are intractable problems. But nature has given us another quantum system that's very controllable and uh, 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 easy, with an easy access in terms of measurement control, et cetera, manipulation to, to simulate those complex systems with and, and learn about their behavior and hopefully enable rational design of better materials such as high TC superconductors and other materials that fall into this, this class. Um, these techniques, this, this toolbox uh, uh, for quantum simulation is actually pretty rich now and it also opens up a new sort of window into discovery of novel phases, uh, novel states of matter. We can also use, um, on the quantum information side of things, quantum states of matter and light to enhance metrology and sensing. And that has to do with better clocks, um, better magnetometry, gravi gravimetry, uh, precision inertial navigation systems, and such. And uh, finally, sort of an emerging area in cold atoms, uh, cold atom research is uh, is the uh, is uh, investigation of non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, and uh, I find that quite exciting because uh, non-equilibrium phenomena are really important in real life in a lot of a lot of uh, scenarios and uh, uh, and uh, in electronics, in photonics, we're getting down to small dimensions and fewer particles and photons. So it's, it's very important to understand where thermalization doesn't necessarily happen, so it's important to understand those. And let me just point out that, um, I mean, this is a very nice list, and I'm certainly hoping in the next couple of years to, uh, to focus more than I, uh, on uh, these uh, discovery of new phases of new states of matter, as well as, as non-equilibrium non -equilibrium phenomena. Okay, here's the outline of my talk, of the results that I, uh, selected to highlight this year. And uh, they cover uh, three or four uh, sub-areas from the previous or the first slide. Um, uh, quantum simulation with strongly interacting quantum gases, uh, dipolar matter, and, and quantum metrology. And 
it's really <laughs> difficult for me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, to pick out each year a few results to highlight in this meeting because there's so many good ones. But anyway, um, once I did that, and it was really after I picked out these four, four PIs that I'm going to highlight today, and when I put together this slide that I realized <laughs> that I noticed that all of these four PIs are young investigators. They are all under 40. Three of them are, in fact, under 35, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I assure you, there's no age discrimination in the program. <laughs> uh, in fact, there are, there are lots of senior people in the program. But this, this really goes to show that these, this research area attracts enormous young talent. And I'm very, very pleased that we can support that here at AFOSA. OK, so let me start with um, uh, quantum simulation. Uh, there's a, a MURI. Uh, I have a MURI that started in FY07, so it ends this summer. It's been going on for four and a half years. Uh, the PI is Marcus Greiner at Harvard. This has been an exceptionally productive and prolific MURI with uh, uh, something like 180 publications so far, about 20 in nature science publications, and about 60 uh, physical review letters. Um, and, uh, and also, Marcus Greiner won uh, the uh, uh, MacArthur Genius Award this past year, as well as uh, uh, AAAS uh, Newcomb Cleveland Award just recently for the best paper in science last year. But anyway, so those are just some, some, uh, some nice things um, about, about, uh, about the PI and the MURI. Um, I will talk to you today about two new results. But first, let me remind you why <laughs> why we're interested in strongly correlated quantum gases and why, why we choose to study that. Um, let's start with some uh, tools that we have at our disposal with cold atoms. Um, optical lattices are exactly what uh, it sounds like, uh, uh, periodic, optical periodic potentials that where atoms sit can be trapped, and we know how to put exactly one atom or close to it per lattice site. And that's uh, very reminiscent of a crystal lattice, of course, and uh, atoms or ions and electrons in a crystal lattice, and those determine, the electrons really do determine the, beha the, the properties of the material. Um, and that's exactly what, what we're going to use this for to simulate some of these um, uh, condensed matter systems that are really, really difficult, whose properties are really difficult, in fact, impossible, or I should say, we, we don't know how to efficiently calculate them with conventional computational means. And those are the strongly correlated materials. And uh, Feynman said 30 years ago, really postulated that this is what we're going to do in the future, and we are doing it, which is simulate one quantum system with another that's a lot more controllable, measurable, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some of those strongly correlated materials happen to be technologically important materials, like high TC superconductors are the poster child example, and those were invented or discovered 25 years ago, and we still don't understand what the mechanism behind those are. But there's a slew of other materials as well. OK, so uh, what Marcus Greiner and his co-workers did this year, one of the things they did, was uh, they, they did quantum simulation of a, of a simple many-body uh, um, model or, or problem, which is the Ising model, in one dimension, OK? Uh, and they observed quantum phase transition from paramagnet to antiferromagnet. And we know all about the 1D Ising model. That's a well-studied system. Uh, nevertheless, this is the first quantum simulation with cold atoms, first example of realizing a many-body system where uh, a, a, a nearest neighbor interaction is included. So that's a breakthrough, as well as uh, anti-ferromagnetic phase is actually really interesting because it is part of the, the model that uh, is believed uh, uh, that has the potential to describe high TC superconductivity, which is a different, it's a Hubbard model, but at half filling, uh, it's uh, in, in the anti-ferromagnetic phase for those <laughs> experts in the audience. So in the remainder of, of this portion of the talk, I will remind you of a, a remarkable instrument that Marcus Greiner and his colleagues invented a couple of years ago. Uh, and a new result on a new cooling technique, and then I'll show you the results of the uh, simulation of the Ising model. So uh, I showed this two years ago. Um, um, this, is, uh, this was a breakthrough in the field at the time. What you see here is a fluorescence image of single, these, are, these green dots are single atoms in a, in a lattice, in an optical lattice, two-dimensional lattice. And here's a depiction of, of those atoms, the, the, the red dots in, a, in 2D and part of the 
optical imaging system. Here's one, pic here's one picture of the part of that Im uh, imaging system. And two years ago, and, and this was a true breakthrough. There's another one that's since been in uh, the one that Scott Dudley likes to talk about in Emmanuel Bloch's group in, in Germany, that they have a microscope now like that as one. Several other groups are developing such, uh, such instruments. Um, and at the time, I pointed out that this, there will be many new possibilities with this instrument for detection, for manipulation at the single atom level, which has been demonstrated. And I also mentioned cooling. And cooling is a big technical barrier in this field because a lot of interesting phenomena, a lot of the regime that's really the high TC regime, if you wish, if, you, if we want to simulate high, uh, uh, high TC superconductors, uh, is at much colder, uh, much lower temperatures than uh, we are today, and that's one of the te technical barriers. And in fact, that is one of the results this year uh, that uh, 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 was achieved at Harvard, a new, really nice technique for cooling that, that relies on removing entropy from the system, really. So let me quickly uh, explain that. It's, uh, it's uh, based on uh, something called interaction-induced orbital excitation blockade. It's very similar to, in spirit, to Coulomb blockade, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So in these uh, optical lattice sites, we have atoms, they sit in them, and here I have one atom sitting in an optical lattice site in the ground state, and the nomenclature here means uh, one atom in ground, zero in the excited state. We can excite it to a vibrational level here, mth, with a photon uh, or light pulse. Um, so that's this picture here. Um, however, if we have more than one atom in one site, uh, like two here in the ground state, that changes, the interaction between them changes, shifts the, the, the levels, okay? So now we apply a light pulse and promote one of these to the excited state, so we have one and one. But the same light pulse of the same frequency will not promote uh, the second one up uh, because of the blockade effect, because of the uh, energy level shift. You have to really, you have to use a different frequency. So that's the, that's the blockade here. And they use that to come up with an algorithm, which I'm, gonna, I'm not going to animate this, to, um, if you have N in the ground state and M in the excited state in a, in a, in a given uh, site, uh, you really want to, um, excite an atom from the ground state to the excited state, and you do that one by one. And let's say we start. So what you see here is the n a total number of atoms in the lattice site, and then a number of uh, atoms in the ground state. Let's say you start with four, and then at certain frequency you can excite one up, but then you have to chirp, chirp your pulse to excite the next one because it's a different frequency and so on. And in the end you end up with one, exactly one in the ground state, and the rest in the excited state which is what you want because, okay, so in a real life situation like Marcus Greiner has in his experiment, here's his optical lattice, this is just a harmonic uh, trap potential, and uh, you typically have at a given temperature have a random occupation of the lattice sites, okay? But you, what you really want do, to do these quantum studies, you want exactly one atom per site. So you have a random occupation, they're all in the ground state because it's pretty cold, um, and then you do these filter operations. You promote everybody except one to the excited state, and then you, you know how, they know how to eject those blue ones, and you end up with the state that you want, which is called the Mott insulator, and then you can check that um, by turning it into superfluid or Bose-Einstein condensate, and that's your sort of signature that you've done well. And here are some beautiful pictures that that works. You start out with a thermal distribution here with lots of defects, and then you go through these operations and you end up with a much nicer, much cleaner uh, atomic sample, MOT insulator, and then you can turn it into superfluid and you get this characteristic signature. This was published in, in Nature recently. Um, okay, so very nice. So now we have a nice sample to start with to do our quantum studies of quantum magnetism, specifically the Ising model, which uh, has most of you probably, at least physicists in the audience, do remember that Ising model has spins, interacting spins, okay, coupled spins, and then you can add some fields, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is the phase diagram, okay? Well, Marcus Greiner uses, Marcus uses um, uh, rubidium atoms, there are no spins, but he and his theoretical colleagues uh, have come up with a very clever mapping, uh, and that's another nice thing about these atoms, you can do almost anything you want, it's a very nice playground that they have there. So nice mapping of spinless bosons using, using motional degrees of freedom onto spins, really. 
So this is how it works. This is a bit of a busy slide. This is from their paper, but let me quickly go through that. So this is our optical lattice. It's a little, it's a tilted lattice, and you'll see why that's so. And we have, we start out with exactly one atom per lattice site. But these atoms can tunnel, not this way because it's tilted like so, but they can tunnel to the right, okay? So if, if, uh, if an atom is in this position, let's say left-hand side, we call that spin up. If it's on the other side, it's spin down, and of course it can be in the superposition. And then you, so this is our paramagnetic state now because all spins are spin up here. And then we tilt the lattice more, which turns out the co it corresponds to adding the field, okay? And then at some point, and that's the point when the, the lattice tilt per, uh, the t uh, per lattice site corresponds to the on-site interaction. So you have resonant transition, if you resonant tunneling. On-site interaction uh, at, at this site, that's when you start to see tunneling. And then if you keep tilting, they all tunnel through, and then you'll get this configuration with, which corresponds to antiferromagnets. So it's, it's really that simple. I mean, it's not that simple, but it looks simple. And then uh, there is a certain way that they, they uh, certain, trans, uh, certain t uh, tunnelings are forbidden, which is really what induces the spin-spin interaction. And then uh, the, the longitudinal fields correspond, uh, field corresponds to this tilt, lattice tilt, and the transfer field corresponds to the tunneling. And here you are, you have a, an Ising model realized in, in which is a spin model, many body model, realized in a, in a cold atom system without spin. Okay, and here's the, here's, uh, the experiment, really, the data. Uh, so here we have, uh, this is with his microscope, right? Here we have all spins lined up. And then as we tilt the lattice, this is how it evolves. And then we have antiferromagnetic uh, uh, ordering down here. Uh, it's beautiful, it corresponds to, of course, field in the, in the magnetic sense. And this was published in, in, in Nature this last year. Um, and I do have some technical details, which I'm going to skip over because um, in the interest of time. But for those of you from condensed matter theory, you will recognize magnetization versus field, et cetera, et cetera. I am going to skip over that and nail, nail order. So all of that is seen. OK, beautiful. So, um, so uh, we, we are really a step closer to doing Mm, high TC superconductivity like kinds of things because uh, I hope I've convinced you of that. Um, however, if you do want to do real material, simulation of real material, you really need to do fermions because electrons are fermions. And a lot of people are doing fermions all over the world. And one of them is Martin Zwierlein at MIT, who's part of this MURI, um, the Harvard led MURI. But he's also, he, he, he had a YIP with us that converted into PKs, a uh, uh, presidential early, early career award. And uh, so I will, in the next few mi next uh, 10 minutes or so, tell you about, about, uh, about his recent work from the, this year on uh, simulating fermionic systems, OK? <coughs> so uh, strongly interacting Fermi gases, that's your strongly interacting materials uh, where the fermions are electrons, like high TC. Let me just, again, say it's not only high TC superconductors. But here's a crystal structure, complex systems. We know that most of the action, superconducting action, goes in 2D in these uh, quasi-2D or 2D uh, copper oxide planes. I'm talking about cuprates here. Um, however, there is interlayer coupling. It's a complicated system, no, and we really don't understand it fully at all. Um, um, so, with cold atoms, these cold Fermi gases are really ideal model system to study these kinds of complicated um, dynamics because we can very controllably, we can, for example, we know that going from 3D to 2D, fluctuations have a larger effect, which tends to suppress TC, right? Um, critical temperature. However, um, in 2D also, um, um, the, the interlayer coupling tends to stabilize superconductivity. So we have competing effects. And we can study such things in a contro very controllable and very systematic way with cold, cold uh, uh, Fermi gases in this case, cold, cold quantum gases. So what Martin has done, which I'll show in the next couple of slides, is that he can go from 3D to 2D pretty much continuously 
by applying an optical lattice in this direction, so separating his 3D gas into 2D pancakes that are more and more 2D as you increase the laser intensity, really. He can also change continuously this, the strength of the interaction among his fermions um, and look at the effect of, of these things on the pairing. That's what he's interested in because it's the pairing, the Cooper pairing in your superconductor or the fermion pairing in your Fermi gas that, that are uh, critical to these phenomena. Okay, so here's a paper that came out recently um, in January in Physical Review Letters on the evolution of fermion pairing from 3D to, do, to do 2D, excuse me. And uh, from the density of states argument, uh, arguments, we, we know that there is a bound state, that there should be a bound state in, in, in two dimensions. Two dimensions, at the same time, fluctuations are more pronounced or uh, more effective in two dimensions uh, that suppress TC. So it's quite possible that one could expect to see pairing without necessarily having superfluidity or superconductivity if you talk the condensed matter language. Okay, the, 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 the technique that he probes his system with is uh, RF spectroscopy. So what you have here is RF spectra going from three to two dimensions. Like I said, he does that by uh, starting with almost no optical lattice, this, this, this blue potential here, and then ramping it slowly up, uh, which is really, th this is the optical potential here, okay? Ramping it slowly up and getting 2D pancakes that are more and more squeezed in, in this direction, okay? And what he sees is that the one peak that we see in 3D splits into two peaks where the zero, this is our offset, where the offset is relative to the zero peak here, which corresponds to free fermion particles unpaired, that all it does, the RF uh, pulse, it just flips the spin. And this peak here, this asymmetric peak has a, a, a characteristic shape of a dissociation peak for fermion pairs. And from that, he can deduce uh, at each of, for each of these curves, binding energy, or pair binding energy. Now, this set of curves is done uh, for um, uh, the, the, the highest possible interaction allowed by quantum mechanics, if you wish, that they can achieve, uh, which is the so-called unitarity regime. They've done the same thing at changing the interaction strength. And that's summarized in this plot here, where again, you have binding energy as a function of going from 3D to 2D. Um, and a different interaction strength. And one interesting result is that <laughs> the data are actually quite well modeled. So let me remind you, this is a strongly interacting system. All the electrons or all the fermions really are interacting with each other strongly. However, the, 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 uh, still the, the data are, um, um, uh, fit very well. Uh, uh, the mean field theory where only a two-body interaction is taken account. So that's surprising, except in this very strongly interacting case. So some of the things that Martin is uh, working on now is, is what is the nature of this pairing? Is it superfluid or is it normal? Uh, they want to in, in, introduce the interlayer coupling. And all of this is, of course, towards understanding, understanding superfluidity or superconductivity and to, uh, towards coming up with, with a recipe for high TC. Um, I, I, I really hope to convey here that the toolbox that we have at our disposal with cold atoms is, is really quite remarkable that we can do all these systematic studies of various, various uh, phenomena and, and uh, properties um, and dynamics. Okay, let me highlight another uh, experiment uh, done in, in um, Martin's group uh, that was uh, published uh, uh, recently in Nature. And that has to do now with its fermions again. I forgot to mention it's lithium-6, not that you care, but uh, just for completeness. Um, and uh, th this has to do now with non-equilibrium phenomena, with spin transport, which of course, you know, uh, electron transport, electron, uh, spin transport is, is, you know, transport phenomena really determine uh, 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 properties of, you know, it determines whether your, your thing is superconducting or insulating and uh, it's obviously important for spintronics. So what, uh, what they've done is they, um, they've taken their lithium-6 atoms and they've put half of them in spin-up, half in spin-down state. They've trapped them in an optical trap. This is all standard. And then they've separated these two clouds with a magnetic field gradient, okay? And then they let the gradient, uh, they turn it off, the magnetic field gradient off. So they, they let the two clouds go towards each other because of the trap, okay? They're, they're um, directed towards each other. I don't know what you would expect to happen <laughs> here, but uh, obviously it's a highly non-equilibrium uh, starting point. And um, I would expect them to kind of 
diffuse into each other. Well, that's not what they do. And this is a snapshot of absorption images of, of uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, first uh, uh, few maybe milliseconds of, of this process. And here's the same thing, just uh, the color uh, uh, shows you spins up and down. And they don't mix. I mean, at first, this is this bottom plot, which you can see probably hopefully on the side screens, shows the center of mass motion for spins up and spins down. And you see there first in the First, there are several bounces. They bounce off of each other. They don't mix, OK? And then there's this highly damped uh, dynamics uh, um, until they finally, after a long time for these kinds of things, which is close to a second, they, they fall on top of each other. OK. So, uh, and they do some quantitative studies where they measure spin drag, diffusivity, and uh, above the Fermi temperature, the, the, the diffus this is diffusivity versus temperature. Uh, they do s observe the, the expected t to the 3 halves law, and then uh, it, uh, it levels off, the diffusivity does, um, which, uh, and this is in this damped regime, uh, which is uh, evidence of uh, quantum-limited spin diffusion, so they've observed that. But I show you this again to convince you that with cold atoms we can study all kinds of things in a very controllable way, and we might get some surprises. Okay, very, very quickly. Um, we're still at MIT, Martin Zwerlein. Um, he also has the capability to do very high precision thermodynamic measurements of these Fermi, uh, strongly correlated Fermi, strongly interacting Fermi gases, the highest precision in the world, in fact. And this is just a, 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 a picture of one of their plots from a recent paper. It, it, it did come out after I put these, I think, sl slides in. Uh, in science, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, observation of superfluid lambda transition in a Fermi gas. This is well known from, you know, helium studies e eons ago, but here's the, the characteristic susceptibility versus temperature lambda shape. But more importantly, these very, um, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want to point out one thing. These very high precision thermodynamic studies that he's able to do are now serving as a benchmark for validation of new theories. And let me remind you, we don't have good theories yet. Uh, we have a slew of them, but no really reliable good theories for strongly interacting Fermi gases, which is why we, do, we don't understand, for example, high DC superconductivity. Well, there's been a recent very exciting development in that area uh, by a couple of theorists at UMass Amherst, not funded by us, let me say that, but I put that paper down because Martin is a co-author and they use his data. They work closely with him. This is uh, Nikolai Prokofiev and Boris Swistunov, where they, uh, they've uh, invented a new technique based on Feynman diagrams that falls right on Martin's data. Four temperatures above TC, and they're trying to expand it to below TC. This will be a revolutionary development if it, if it works. And high precision uh, experiments are critical for this. Okay. We've talked about bosons, fermions, quantum simulations, very rich toolbox. Well, let's add, you know, these, these atoms interact mostly by, through collisions, uh, contact interaction. Um, well, let's add to the mix long-range interaction to the toolbox. Now we're talking about dipolar matter, so dipole-dipole interaction, and that can be done with polar molecules, which I talked about last year and I'm not going to talk about today. We can be done with uh, dipolar atoms and I'm going to talk about one of them, dysprosium. It can be done with Rydberg atoms, OK? Um, this has gotten, this has become last couple of years just really a hot topic and has gotten theorists very excited that we have this new, new control knob, so to speak, that can uh, give us a window into whole new sort of research areas and new physics, really. OK, so Benjamin Lev. He's, current, he's now at Stanford. He moved uh, uh, recently, but all of the data that I'll show is, is at the University of Illinois, uh, was taken at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's our YIP uh, awardee um, and had a wonderful, very productive YIP. And let me just remind you, dipole-dipole interaction, because it's 1 over uh, r to the third, so it's long range. It's anisotropic. It can be repulsive if you have your dipoles lined up side by side. It can be attractive if you have them head to tail, so it really does add richness to our already pretty um, rich world. And like I've mentioned, 
theorists have gone crazy lately with uh, predicting all kinds of exotic quantum phases, uh, you know, with, with dipolar matter, uh, supersolids, uh, uh, quantum liquid crystals, uh, topologically ordered materials that uh, might provide us with topologically protected quantum computers, all kinds of things. Okay. Well, uh, Benjamin Lev studies dysprosium, and uh, that's here in the periodic table. It's a lanthanide, and um, it's, 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 it's an interesting element because it has the highest magnetic moment of all the atoms in the periodic table, 10 Bohr magnetons. Chromium has, I believe, six, so that's another one. Um, the problem with the dysprosium is that, uh, that those of you who know something about laser cooling, all of this is interesting, uh, of course, at very cold, we're talking about ultra cold things here in this talk today. Um, all of you who know, uh, who know about laser cooling, you know that, that uh, a simple uh, energy level structure helps and having a cycling transition, a simple cycling transition is essential. And this is dysprosium energy, so it's, it's, it's a mess, okay? So that's what makes it difficult to cool. However, there, have been previous, there has been previous work on erbium and chromium that, that's really uh, been a good starting point for, for Benjamin. Um, and I want to also point out on this slide that uh, dysprosium is nice because they, uh, they're bosonic and fermionic uh, atoms. All right, I'm going to go over this very quickly. Birth announcement of dysprosium BEC, Bose-Einstein condensate. That's one of the achievements in his lab this past year, uh, reported in physical review letters. This is a typical birth announcement. Um, two years ago, I reported on the first MOT, uh, uh, Doppler cooling of dysprosium, and now I'm very happy to report a BEC. Uh, there's interesting behavior due to dipolar interaction in a magnetic field as the magnetic field changes angle. But really, I, what I want to convey with this slide, we have a dysprosium BC now. That's very, very nice. First dysprosium BC, but not first dipolar atom BC, because chromium BC exists um, in uh, two places in the world, in Germany and in Paris, Germany and France. Now we have dysprosium in here. Um, but even more, more interestingly, and this is a true first, um, from BEC, in order to get a BEC down to BEC temperature, we do something like uh, evaporative cooling. After we do Doppler cooling, we do evaporative cooling, which really relies on being uh, on elastic collisions, and then you get rid of the hot atoms by lowering your trap, and they just, you know, escape. Um, well, it's been very well known that you can do that with fermions, okay? It's much uh, harder to cool fermions down to quantum degenerate, uh, to quantum degeneracy. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the, the, the threshold for these P wave elastic collisions for fermions is well above the TC, the, the, the critical temperature. But that's for your plain fermions. <laughs> and um, so what he's done, he's put l here four species of dysprosium. One of them is fermionic, 161. Is that right? Okay, I think that's one. That's right. And he's, he's tried, okay? doing eva evaporation, evaporative cooling, and they all lie on top of each other. This is temperature vers versus uh, uh, time for ev evaporative cooling. So that's very interesting. So it works as well for the green guys uh, uh, as well as, as for the other ones. And he's done the same thing for number of fermions in the trap, which is a measure also of how well you're doing cooling. And, it's, it's, and this is raw data, not normalized, but they do fall on top of each other if you normalize. So these slides <laughs> were before the paper was written, okay? Uh, the paper is now submitted, so uh, that's why everything's kind of question marks and whatnot. But, um, but there is a question now, now do, we have, do we see universal dipolar scattering here? Is this, uh, and indeed, um, he's still reluctant to say yes, but, but the point here is um, because of dipole-dipole interaction, okay, with dysprosium, evaporative cooling actually works for fermions, which is really nice because now, but it does, and he's gotten it down to 1.3 uh, Fermi temperature. Uh, so that's really, really nice. And he now, therefore, has both Fermi mixtures of dipolar, ultra-cold dipolar gas. So that's a unique system in the world. We do expect to see great things from it. And here's a birth announcement of the first dipolar, the generate Fermi gas. Last year, I talked about polar molecules, and I told you how there's a race in the world who's going to get the first 
dipolar, polar molecule degenerate from a gas? Well, it came from dysprosium, really. Um, and uh, I don't have to tell you, uh, you can trust me that this is, this is what it says. <laughs> um, okay, I have five minutes left, which is enough for my last topic. Uh, which is now very different from, from, from these three. It's quantum metrology, uh, and it's really clocks, and uh, I'm going to talk about recent development of a new technique that's very exciting to me um, because it's going to make these, these powerful techniques that they use at NIST in Boulder accessible to a much wider uh, number of people and, and laboratories, including some of my PIs. Um, this is Till Rosenband in Dave Winan's group at NIST in Boulder. And, um, and uh, what you see here is uh, the history of, it, of atomic clock precision in the last several decades, since the 70s. And we are currently now the most precise, um, the best uh, clock in the world is at NIST. It's the aluminum clock, um, ion clock, and, um, and, um, and this is also the first app, this is not new, by the way, this is not the result I'm reporting today. This is a sort of an intro. Um, and and this, is, this is a clock that's enabled by quantum information science, by entanglement, and I'll show you how. So this is the first application, true real world application of quantum information science, okay? Um, we are already applying it to really useful things like clocks. And here's how. It's something called quantum logic spectroscopy. Um, and I'm talking about this because the technique that the new one builds upon this one. So aluminum, is our, aluminum ion is our uh, clock ion here and uh, optical qubit. This transition is, is optical and that's going to give us a really, a really precise clock. However, um, this uh, shelving transition which we need for readout of the clock state is really inaccessible because it's at 167 nanometers. So what they've done um, is they have coherently coupled the aluminum qubit to magnesium qubit, which uh, has hyperfine states here as qubit states, but it has a very nice uh, readout state here, if you wish. Um, and so that, and the two are coupled through the Coulomb interaction. They, these are ions, okay, so through motional, motional degrees of freedom. So this is our high precision clock but we don't know how to read it out, but then we couple it coherently to one that we do, and that's quantum logic spectroscopy, a very, very, very simplistic picture of it. And it works beautifully. Um, here's my simple movie, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so we, we, we really can, this is uh, one of the clock, let's say this is the zero qubit, this is the one qubit um, of the aluminum, and the magnesium signal clearly shows you so. And what do we need for this clock, we, uh, for this quantum logic spectroscopy? We need to cool to the motional ground state. So to the ground state, it's, it can be done, um, obviously, but it's, you know, not easy. Um, we are dealing with a single vibrational quanta here uh, as we excite uh, this, this, this uh, normal mode here. And that's all nice. It was uh, done a few years ago and works beautifully, 99.94 uh, detection fidelity. But what I want to really tell you about today is a new technique in the same lab called coherent drive spectroscopy. And why is that exciting? Well, because we don't have to cool these, these guys to the ground state. Um, we can use just Doppler cooling, which simplifies the laser system a lot, okay? Um, we also don't use the, the, the uh, we don't have to, we don't, we're not dealing with single vibrational quanta, we're driving the motion, so we're not using, we're using off-resonant light, which really is great because you don't get scattered photons which introduce noise into, in the system. And, um, and here's the signal. Uh, um, I don't know if I'm gonna tell you, have the time to tell you what it m means, but, or the details about it, but here's the signal. The, the, the zero qubit, we get this from magnesium. Uh, the, the one qubit, we get this. It works really well. Um, and we don't get, have any scattering photons. I already talked about it. We have much simplified laser system. It is slower. Of course, they haven't optimized it fully yet. Um, and given that I have under a minute, I, I'm happy to answer questions about how it works, because it's very neat. 
but I'm not going to do that here. Um, but because of the simplified laser system, because you're not using resonant light, you're using off-resonant, this can be now applied to many more species. Um, Till Rosenben at my program review in January said they were so excited, excited about quantum logic spectroscopy, which is very powerful, gave us the best clock, and they thought everybody be, would be using it and nobody did. But this, I think, really a lot of people will use, uh, people who do molecular ions and exotic species. And uh, they observe quantum jumps between the two aluminum states, and here's the 93% in 80 milliseconds, which is not as good as quantum logic spectroscopy, but it also can be optimized further. And I just, in the remaining few seconds, want to say that I do collaborate with other agencies, with my colleagues there, and I'm particularly pleased with uh, very close collaboration and coordination with the DOD agencies, the four of us at ARO, uh, DARPA, ONR, and AFSR work very closely together. We coordinate our core programs, MURI topics, DURIPS even, YIPS, and it's, uh, it's been a very fruitful and very enjoyable collaboration, and thank you for your attention. Since we were running a little bit ahead, we do actually have time for some <laughs> questions, if there are any. On your slide 32, what, now what leads these people to pick aluminum out of all of the elements? Why do you stumble on aluminum following the green line? You, there seems to be a random selection here, but I'm sure there isn't. No, it's so not. what is the physics behind yeah. this choice? So, um, so it really shows the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the shift from um, um, hyperfine um, states, using hyperfine states to using optical, optical qubits. So with optical ones, uh, you, get, you get, with optical transitions, you get these very narrow line widths, very long-lived states, which then give you very, very high precision. This is not by chance. It's people have, you know, searched for this. And so this whole, this whole um, uh, quest towards optical, actually DARPA started a program that has a very large, uh, last year, that has a very large component devoted to optical clock. So that's been sort of the, 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 the driving force, and that's what gives you very high precision. However, m many of those, like aluminum, one of the barriers was, uh, technical barriers was, you can't cool it, you don't have that cycling transition that's accessible with lasers, okay? You can't cool it, you can't read it out. So it's really quantum information and entangling it with something we know how to cool and read out that, that's enabled now going this optical clock route in this case with aluminum. Any other questions? If not, then uh, we'll, we're on a break and uh, we'll start right promptly at 3.30. <laughs>